good morning. As we continue, as we continue with our theme uh, for this month, which is basically Thanksgiving, I would want to continue with another psalm, um, a psalm of thanksgiving. We're not given the author of that psalm. It is Psalm 100. Psalm 100. And if you have a Bible with you, uh, turn with me to Psalm 100. It is a psalm of thanksgiving and a psalm that is full of praise, uh, full of adoration, and full of gratitude. If you're there, I'll read Psalm 100. A psalm of thanksgiving. Make a joyful shout to the Lord. O oh, you lands or earth, save the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanks giving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Our Father, we pray that you may help us as I bring forth your word to your people and to myself that God, this Son, may speak to us Encourage us to become Christians who are full of thanksgiving. To challenge those who are not Christians to remember that they did not make themselves the someone who made them to whom they ought to be thankful. But more so, O oh God, to save the Lord with gladness and thanksgiving in our hearts. Lord, I pray that this word will speak to all of us and at the end we'll be able to say it was worth it to be in the presence of our great God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I want to invite you to this psalm as we continue this theme of thanksgiving for the month of November. Last time I stood here, we looked at Psalm 103, in which we looked at how we, in the words of David, ought to bless the Lord. As David was speaking to himself, and say, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name, and forget not his benefits. And indeed, David tabulates the benefits which you and I ought to be thankful to the Lord. That is, he forgives our iniquities. He heals our diseases, spiritual and physical. He redeems our lives from destruction. He's the keeper 
preserver of our lives. And he crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies. And that he satisfies our mouths with good things. So that we are renewed in our lives spiritually. And I would want to say physically. And David says there is every reason to say thank you to God. And Psalm 100 is a psalm that has become so popular ever since it was penned. That this is a psalm of thanksgiving. Many hymns and songs have been written based on this short psalm of only five verses or stanzas. And what I want to do this morning is to help us, my dear brothers and sisters and dear friends, that we may know that this our God deserves to be thanked. I know we live lives that are so busy preoccupied with so many things that are so self-centered and sometimes we forget that we have the keeper of our souls we have the provider of all the things we need we have one who created us who chose that you be born into this world and not die at birth or be a stillborn child. That God has graciously allowed you to continue to live up to today. And many a time we forget that there is a maker. And the maker is God. This is a psalm which was written and also reminding us just to give us a brief background reminding us of what used to happen to the Jews the people of God as they went to the temple as they went to a temple it was a moment of not just sacrifice it's not just a moment of confessing and of their sins, but it was also a moment of entering the presence of God with hearts that were full of thanksgiving. And hence you see that as the psalmist puts it, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Now it's important to note that these are not just words being used, gets, calls. The Jewish temple was surrounded with a wall. And the inner walls of that temple had gates. And not just gates, it also had courts. And basically it had about 13, 13 gates. And then within the courts, you would find the Gentile court, which was the outer part. There, everybody who was not a Jew would get into the outer part which was the Gentile court. And you draw closer in there, you start to have all these different courts. And the very the inner place where you find those who are assigned to save in the temple. Not everyone entered the inner part of the temple. There were these different courts. For a time, I'll show you the different chambers 
of the temple. But my area of interest is to, uh, for us to appreciate that there were gates. Thirteen of them. And the main gate there would be what we often hear, the beautiful gate. And there were all these other twelve gates. And the psalmist is saying, as you come to the temple of God, as you come in the presence of God, he says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. And into his courts with, with praise. Be thankful to him. Now I want to say this is a psalm which you can easily memorize. Easily memorize. And make it a psalm of your heart. Each time you feel low, or each time you feel as if God has abandoned you. And remember, make a joyful shout to the Lord. Oh, the earth. Save the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made you and not yourself. And we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Therefore, enter his gates with thanksgiving. What I want to do to help us appreciate this psalm, I'll try to reverse it. Because thanksgiving does not happen just automatically. Nor does it come in the heart of a child of God. That it's an obvious thing. It is based on the knowledge of God, who He is. It's based not just on the knowledge of God, but also what He has done, what He has promised. But also, it stems out of a heart that has been touched by God. That's what makes the Christian faith unique. It's a faith where we respond to what God has done in our lives. And as we respond to what God has done in our lives, we open our hearts. The floodgates of thanksgiving and praise. Meaning, you can only write and God honor thank him if you are a child of God. Those who are not Christians cannot honor him and in a God honoring man thank God. This comes as a response to what God has done. And therefore the psalmist what he does, and that's what I want to do to help us appreciate this psalm. Basically, I want to draw your attention to three observations. And these three observations, basically, I have, I have flipped the psalm. And the way I've done by flipping the psalm, instead of beginning with, Make a sh joyful shout to the Lord, all nations, or enter his gates with thanks. I want to show us first that proper thanksgiving, proper praise and worship, proper, proper adoration, first is based on a biblical knowledge of truth, a biblical knowledge of who God is. That's the foundation for a life of thanksgiving. 
you and I, who only thank God to the extent of our knowledge of God. If you do not know God, you will not thank Him in this attitude and manner. This is why I'm saying, first, instead of rushing into making a joyful shout to the Lord, what makes one to shout, what makes one to enter into his presence with thanksgiving, what makes a Christian to live a life of thanksgiving, I want to submit to us first is to have a knowledge of the truth concerning Yahweh, God, and what he has said or promised. And secondly, based on that knowledge, it's that knowledge which will give birth to a life of thanksgiving. So when you notice that your life is less of thanksgiving, it's simply because you are ignorant of who God is and what God has done for you. So thirdly, it's where I want to show us the, the nature of this kind of thanksgiving, where it bubbles, enter his gates with praise. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Make a shout, a joyful shout to the Lord. That can only happen, my dear brothers and sisters, if your heart has been touched by God and you have a biblical knowledge of who God is and what God has done. You cannot thank God in this manner and attitude if you do not know God. There is no relationship. And also if you are disobedient, to God. So notice with me the basis or the foundation for a life of thanksgiving as it is expressed here in Psalm 100. It's the knowledge of God. And this is why I want to flip it. We start with verse 3. Notice with me what the psalmist tells us. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Verse 5. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations. Those two verses are the foundation, the basis upon which you and I would thank God or live a life of thanksgiving. First, it's a knowledge of who this God is. And under these two verses are basically about seven observations concerning this God and what he has done and what he has promised to do. Because that's the basis, that's the foundation from which thanksgiving will be birthed. Notice with me it's a knowledge of who he is. Who is this God? The son says, Know that the Lord, he is God. Now I know in our English translation, we can't see it there. That Lord there is Yahweh. And that God there is Adonai. He's saying, know that Yahweh is Adonai. 
And for you to thank God, you must know Him. That He is Yahweh. And I know the first time that you see or meet God Himself, speaking of Himself, of who are you? Moses asked in Exodus chapter 3. When I go back there to Egypt, I'm scared. When they ask me who was sent you, and God said, The I am is the one who was sent you. I am who I am. That's Yahweh. And Yahweh basically is the name of God which the Jews would not even uh, um, utter. It's like simply you say, ah, and that it ends with, ah. this is a holy name which describes God, Yahweh, which simply means he is who he is. He is self existent he does not depend upon anyone to exist. He lives outside space and time. He is above all. I am who I am. And when Moses asked God, this is how God answered. Let me just read to you Exodus 3 verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. And it is this name, Yahweh. So when the psalmist says, Know that the Lord, Yahweh, the I am, He is the one who has created all things. He does not depend upon you to exist. He does not depend upon your money to grow his kingdom. He does not depend upon your faithfulness to do what he desires to do. He is self existence He does not depend upon anyone. He is Yahweh. I am who I am. To know that the God who is calling you to say thank you to him is one who is self-existence. Therefore it ought to be an honor, a privilege. And in fact, let me put it this way, a holy duty if you're a child of God to say Thank you. But notice he's also saying, the Lord, in verse 3, he is God. Now that word God there, in the original text, is Adonai, which simply means the master of all, where you may even say the sovereign ruler of all the earth. The one who rules, the one who has power, the majestic, almighty God, the Adonai. He says, I am who I am, but also the mighty one. Friends, this is a powerful God who calls you and me to say thank you. He is not your equal. He is above you. 
So in knowledge of this God, I believe will draw us to our knees, lifting up our holy hands and saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you have looked upon me. Who is of no worth. Let me read to you a text from First Kings chapter 18. This is the God whom the psalmist is saying. The God who is the Lord. In 1 Kings chapter 18, this is a wonderful story. A number of you may be familiar of it when Elijah and the gods of, or the Baals, those who are not gods. And Elijah had to champion and say, let's see who is the true Yahweh here. And so, all these 450 false prophets came against this one man called Elijah. And so, to prove who was a true prophet of God, let me just not go into much detail. Let me just read from verse 39. After they had done all the chanting and everything, nothing happened. And Elijah makes this statement. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, Yahweh, He is God, the Almighty. The Lord, He is God. That's the name of the God we worship. He is the I am who I am. Self-existence. Outside space and time. You cannot manipulate or control him. He is outside your capacity to even engage. He is Yahweh. And yet at the same time, this very God he is the almighty, the ruler of all the earth. That is our God. And so when the psalmist says, know that the Lord, He is God, that's what he's referring to. Pause, stand still, and consider the God who is asking you to say, thank you. But notice, secondly, he does not just end at telling us who this God is. But it's also a knowledge of what he has done. In that verse 3b, this is what he has done. It is he who has made us. Now, friends, you can do whatever you may try to do cannot change the you. People have tried to bleach their skin. People have tried in this generation of perversion even to change in terms of their sexuality. People have tried to do all sorts of things. You cannot change the you. Someone greater than you, Yahweh, the Almighty, has made you. You did not make yourself. Yes, you may say you were born of your mom, your dad, but where did they come from? Who made you? Maybe if you didn't know that you were made by God, 
Let's just read a few Psalms. It's been a few pages on your right. How David describes God. That is a maker of all human beings. In Psalm 139, verse 13 to 16. This is how the psalmist puts it. For you, Psalm 139, verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. Speaking to God. You covered me in my mother's womb. Friends, yes, biology may explain this, but beyond biology, there is a maker. And he says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame, he tells us there in verse was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed. And in your, in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. He has made us. He knew us even before we existed. He knew us even there in secret where we be, when we were being formed. <laughs> and he knew everything about us, concerning us, to what we are. Today, he made us. And in fact, in the words of the sons, he even knows the days you're going to live here on earth. He knows the hour, the place, the occasion when you will expire from this world. He knows. He formed you. In other words, he is basically the keeper of your life, not yourself, not the doctors, not your mother, not your father, but God. And this is what he's saying, that he made us, he made you, and therefore to boast, and if I may speak to those of you who are not Christians, to boast of your life is to act like one of the most foolish persons in this world. And true, without Christ, that's who you are. There is someone who is a maker. He is the one who preserves and keeps you. And brethren, it is this knowledge of what he has done that he has made us and not we ourselves, which ought to drive us on our knees and on a daily basis when you wake up to say, thank you, Lord, for another day. But thirdly also, it's a knowledge that we belong to him. And I'm speaking here to us who are Christians. And you cannot miss it there in verse 3. We are his people. We are his people. If you are a child of God, you don't belong to yourself. You sold your rights the day you said, Yes, Lord Jesus Christ, come be my Savior and my Master. That's the day you actually died to yourself. You belong to God. We are his people. God owns us. And to boast and to foolishly live as if we own ourselves, it's a lack of knowledge of who we are as children of God. This is why God does not demand 
like that tyranny over your life, your resources, your time, and everything about you. He knows you are mine, and one day you will truly give an account over your life because you are simply a steward of what God has deposited in your life. You belong to Him. You are not your own. And these, these are words that come very clear in, in John chapter 1 verse 2, verse 12, I'm sorry, to 13. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Children born not of the natural descent, nor of human choice or man's will, but of God. Those who believed, those who received him, became the children of God. So for us who are Christians, we belong to him. We are his people. Brothers, sisters, do we ever think of ourselves in this manner? That you are not your own. There's someone called Yahweh, Adonai, who owns you. Therefore, he demands that you give thanks to him. In that owning you, in this particular sense, those of us who are Christians, we are also told there in the fourth place, it is to acknowledge that he is our shepherd. He is our shepherd. And that's what he tells us. We are his, his, his people and the sheep of his pasture, meaning you are the sheep, he is the shepherd. And we know what that means. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep does not hear my voice, but they obey and do that which I command. We are the sheep of his pasture. Meaning, my dear brothers and sisters, friends, listen. This is just deeper than just belonging to God. He manages your life. He is the chief shepherd of your life. He has everything you need to live a happy, successful, and God-honoring life. He is the shepherd and therefore he feeds you, he guides you, he protects you, he provides everything and nothing will touch you which he is not aware of. Nothing. Nothing surprises God concerning his children. And that's exactly what we read here in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I will not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul and leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Because we are the sheep of his pasture. He will take care of your life. Yes, he will manage your life. Yes, he's not saying everything will be easy. But just know you are his sheep. And then he goes to say, Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. For you are with me. Friends, he is our shepherd. This knowledge... That is our shepherd. We are a sheep. Brethren ought to lead us to say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But number five, notice with me also, it's a knowledge that our God is good. And that's what we read in verse five. I am saying that true 
biblical thanksgiving is based on the knowledge of God, the truth about God. He is good, for the Lord is good. Who is good but God alone? In the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, in Luke chapter 18, verse 19, He is good and does good. That's what Psalm 119 tells us in verse 68. You are good and you do good. The Lord is good to all. And his tender mercies are over all his works. He is good. Now when you think of him being good, it's like that so we say. Surely goodness, yes and mercy, shall follow me all the days. He is a good God. This is not a kind of a God like those other gods. This is our Father. This is our Shepherd. This is our Creator. He knows our friend. We are weak. He is good and always good. For you, Lord, are good, ready to forgive, and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon your name. He is good. A knowledge that, uh, of, of this kind that our God is a good God will truly lead a true, genuine, converted child of God to say thank you. No wonder New Testament, those people giving thanks always in everything, give thanks because our God is good. Let me hand it on, but also a knowledge of God's enduring love. But His love endures forever. That's what you read in the latter part of verse 5. His mercy. Is everlasting. That this is a faithful God. His mercy is everlasting. I know of myself and maybe yourself as well. You are the limit. And some people are foolishly, they're even proud to say, I've got a limit. When, when I get to my limit, and, and whatever, and so on and so forth. You see what I'm going to do. Not so with our God with regard to his children. He is merciful, enduring love. His steadfast love endures forever in order to see his character based in the lives of of his children, faithfully enduring. I know it's one thing to talk about what I'm saying, it's another thing to live it. But the truth is, our God has this enduring, everlasting mercy upon his children and even his creation. He doesn't just give up. In fact, this enduring mercy was best demonstrated to us in and through his son. All you need to do is just read Romans chapter 5 and just see we who were weak, we who were enemies of God, we who were sick, we were the very point of no energy to do anything good. He sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God himself came to rescue humanity, 
a rebellious humanity and rescued us. And today, those of us who are Christians who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ are able to say, I am a child of God. Think of it. Some of you who got saved later, even in early years, he looked upon you in your stubbornness. And at an appointed time, he drew your heart, arrested your heart, and made you willing to repent of your sins and to put your faith in him. He is enduring in his love. And he is even today. But number seven, notice, it's the knowledge of God's faithfulness to his people. And that's what you read in the latter part of verse 5. And his truth endures to all generations. He is a faithful God. And he's, he stands on his character and nature. When we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. That's what Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 13. He never runs out of his faithfulness. He is faithful to himself, faithful to his promises, faithful to his deeds. His truth endures to generation to another generation. You can still experience God. They experienced God thousand years ago. We are still experiencing this faithful Yahweh who is the Almighty. Based on this truth, the knowledge of God and what He has done ought to drive you and me. First, let me say to those of you who are not Christians, to seek and to look up to this God. He created you. He knows everything you're passing through. He knows what you're going to pass through. And He is committed because He's a good God that at the end of your life, good will be the fruit of your life, not disaster. That's like the psalmist tells us, the psalm which we read the other time, that it's He who redeems your life from destruction. This is the God calling you, if you are not a child of God, to turn to Him, to repent of your sins, to accept Him, to believe, put your faith in Him, ask Him for mercy. His mercy endures forever. He will not reject you. Because that's His nature. He's a good God. And he desires to have more and more of his creation become his ship of his pasture. Turn to Christ. Look to Christ. Once he's done that, you will have every reason to thank him. Plan to us who are Christians, listen. This knowledge should then steer our hearts to thank God. And I'm asking myself, Kabwe, where is this heart that bubbles with joy? Where is this heart that goes to God and says, Thank you, Lord. Listen, this is the heart of one who is redeemed. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. You know this, God. Friends, even in the air of our worship, before we even speak of our lives, you can't miss that in the heart of this person, these individuals being described and invited to give thanks to God, there is, you can tell, some excitement, some feeling, yes, some emotions enter his gates with thanksgiving. 
And he doesn't just say with thanksgiving. Enter into his courts with praise. And then he pauses and he says, Be thankful to him. Dear child of God, are you thankful to him? I know the nature of human beings. You want to compare yourself to somebody else. Look up to God. Are you thankful to him? Often you compare yourself to those who have more things than you do. To those who are better than you are. Are you thankful to him? You can't miss the feeling here. You can't. As you enter into his gates. Friends, as you enter into those different courts in the temple. And in our case, it's not the temple we are talking about. Wait a minute. Do you know that the Jewish people were in somewhat restricted? Only the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies once in a year. But when Christ Jesus died, the curtain split that you and I now can enter into the very Holy of Holies and commune with God as our Father. That's why he says, enter his praises with singing. We, 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 we engage with God. It's not just a theological, doctrinal statement. This is reality. All those who are children of God ought to enter the presence of God as they enter and come before God with this reality that you are communion you are communing with Yahweh and Adonai. You are communing with your creator, your shepherd, your keeper, and your provider. We, we are privileged, brethren. And many a time, and I'm speaking to myself as well, as we enter into the presence of God, they say, worship God. It's as if he's far away. Christ Jesus. Let me just read to you a passage of scripture from Hebrews and chapter 10. This is how the author puts it. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have great priests over the house of God, let us draw near with true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And that's Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. Speaking of our privilege. Those of us who know Christ Jesus, our thanksgiving ought to be different, brethren. Totally different. We are unthankful people. And oftentimes we murmur and complain. He tells us, he invites us as you enter his gates for these people who are of the Jewish community, then the temple. But for us, we are not coming to church here as the temple. We have communion with Christ. In fact, we are even more privileged. Christ lives in you. You commune, you live, you walk, you eat, you sleep with him. He abides within you. 
the soul. Maybe that helps you to see how backslidden we are as Christians. How ignorant we are of who we are. Be thankful to him and bless his name. And finally, let me conclude how this thanksgiving ought to be performed. I ask myself, and here I'm, I'm, I'm restricting myself to this passage of scripture. Listen verse 1 and 2. Just in the context of those that are coming. Listen to verse 1 and 2. This is how this thanksgiving ought to be demonstrated in the life of anyone who knows that I am a child of God. The psalmist says, make a joyful shout. Make a joyful shout. There is action there. Make a joyful shout. But listen. It's not just a joyful shout to feel good. Make a joyful shout to the Lord. That's where thanksgiving is all about. To the Lord. A joyful shout to the Lord. And each time you see the word there, giving thanks in, in, in the context of the Hebrew people, it was a public declaration, acknowledgement. This is not a private thing. And that's why he tells them, enter his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praises, be thankful and bless the name of the Lord. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Make a joyful shout to the Lord. And come before his presence with singing. Vamnina, listen briefly as I apply one or two things here. To make a joyful shout. You know, naturally Zambians enjoy singing. We are singers by nature. Every occasion they singing. A baby is born, they singing. At the funeral, they singing. When something good happens, they singing and dancing. That's who we are. But it's not just to sing and shout to enjoy. It is to the Lord. To the Lord is to make a joyful noise to the Lord. This is to cry out in celebration, in acknowledgement of who he is, of what he has done and his promises toward us that we shout for joy to the Lord and be thankful. Let me just make a simple illustration here. This is like shouting. When, say, for example, a king is coming, I've never been to these Umutomboko or Kusetia Pangwena for the members or the, the other places, I don't know, in, um, in, in Wapula province. But, but, but at least I've watched when the king is approaching, there is jubilation. They shout. It's like giving this celebration to the king, an earthly king. By a turn, course. By a turn. Friends, at cannabis, and they will say all kinds of things to the king. This is the king of kings. This is Yahweh, the I am. This is Adonai, the almighty, the sovereign ruler of all the earth. 
This is the one who created you and me. This is the one who provides as your shepherd and protects you. This is the one who knows the framework of your body and your soul. This is the one calling you that make it joyful. Make it joyful. Shout to the Lord. And we worship him. We thank him. As if to use Bemba. To remove Willa Kofiorus. As if it's just a favor. It's not. You are his creation. Even the king would say, these are my subjects. No king has ever created any subject. But they still shout. They still shout. You know, I know today is 20th. And something is happening today. What is it? Huh? Huh? Someone said football. It's today the World Cup starts. You watch what will be happening there when they score. You don't have to say, yeah, mind, unless it's not your team. This is our team. You shout uncontrollable. You are out there shouting. It reminds me of a story I read. Here is a guy who was there. Behind, actually, there was a fellow church member. And he was supporting the idea. You know, he was seated in front. And was just shouting, you know, speaking and saying, Ah, the way that you want to support and so forth. And lo and behold, when that guy turned, because well, this guy was surprised. Who is this guy who is so joyous and wants us to win? And when he turned, and he discovered it was one of the deacons. I'm a He said, this man doesn't sing and shout the way he does. Here at the ground. There's something, there's some connection to sport. Like I did mention to you, the, the, the word of sport is not an innocent. It's an idol in itself. And people don't even realize. He is the king of kings. The Lord of Shout to him. A joyful noise. Yes. Come before his presence with singing. Brethren, the church is backslidden. Christians do not know their God. Christians have departed from God. This God demands that you make a shout noise to him of praise. But also notice just the matter of application. Because of this truth, the psalmist tells us and says, Come on, save the Lord with gladness. Save the Lord with gladness. This is the spirit of thanksgiving with gladness. How many of us save the Lord? grudgingly, complaining. There's no joy. There's no excitement. There's nothing like saying thank you for God, for God for what you have done. And therefore I want to save you with gladness. It has to do with the knowledge. Know that the Lord Yahweh is Adonai, the one who rules your life. Save the Lord with gladness. Another application and I'm done. Come into his presence with singing. Friends, this kind of singing is worshiping, adoration. This is where God's name is lifted up. This is whereby when somebody who is not a child of God walks into your midst and someone says, Who is this God? Who makes people sing and worship in this manner. Remember hearing somebody saying, as a church when you're saying, let's sing and worship our God. Let each and every soul in that congregation 
tell himself ourselves that we are the only ones in this town worshiping God. You heard what I said? We are the only ones. So let God receive all the praise and the singing. Praise like I have already mentioned, Zambians love singing. We love to sing. And when we come before the presence of the Lord, because of not knowing or because of our, our own backsliding, we don't sing as we come in His presence with this attitude. It's our Christian holy duty to thank the Lord. How thankful are you to the Lord? How often do you thank Yahweh? How often do you simply say, Lord, thank you? In this text, he's not asking you of any sacrifice. He's asking you to give him a thankful heart in response to what he has done for you but also in response to who he is. He is Yahweh, the self-existent God, the I Am. He is Adonai, the almighty ruler of all the earth, including your life. Let's give thanks to God. And let's learn to be thankful. Amen.